is primarily Isaiah chapter 7. There are two important technical observations I feel compelled to share with you before we even begin. The first is, as you can see quite obviously in the top line here, this isn't only Isaiah chapter 7, but what I've described as Isaiah chapter 7 and 8a. And the truth is that it's always a difficult decision to conclude exactly how much should be included in one session. The fact that the first four verses of chapter 8 are included in this session is because I think on reflection they connect much more strongly to chapter 7 than to the balance of chapter 8 that follows. We've noted this in the past. The division of the books of the Bible, with the exception of the Psalms, into chapters is a rather late division that, from our perspective, does not accord with our tradition, so we don't feel any particular necessity to embrace the conventional division. Hence, again, Isaiah chapter 7 and 8a. That's the first point of note, admittedly technical, before we begin today's session. The second point is much more substantive, and that really pertains to the opening line here, but not only the opening line. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, particular king, particular time. We've encountered in our study of Isaiah thus far, the particular designation of a king of a time frame before. We saw this, after all, in chapter 6 which began with the words, in the year of the death of King Uziahu. Still and all, in chapter 6, I think it was much easier for us to discern the sort of universal themes that really transcend the bounds of time. Whereas, in chapter 7, we aren't only treated to the particular time frame, this is taking place in the days of Ahaz, we're also given the particular circumstances that occasioned this prophecy. As we shall see, the circumstances of the prophecy are entirely grounded in the geopolitical, international intrigues that were taking place in its time. And inevitably, of course, that presents a challenge to us because while those prophecies that are so abstract that it isn't even clear in what historical context we are to place them, obviously address us as well here we encounter a prophecy that has an explicit and very specific focus, a focus that of course pertains to the kingdom of Judah approximately 2006 or 700 years ago. So inevitably we wonder to what extent do these words apply to us. And I feel compelled to remind us all of an observation that we made in the past, indeed, in our introduction to the book of Isaiah, on the difference between the way we relate to the Torah, the five books of Moses, and the way we relate to the words of the prophets. The Torah, the five books of Moses, are entirely timeless. The content there, in a very real sense, we don't root in time, and we regard its messages as just as directly addressed to us as they were addressed 
directly to the people of Israel in the Sinai wilderness around 3,000 years ago. This, as opposed to the words of the prophets, the words of the prophets are anchored in time. The prophets spoke to their contemporaries. And it's important for us to appreciate that these messages, these messages that the books of the prophets comprise are first and foremost the timely messages that were addressed to the prophets' audiences. Our mission, as we've noted, is first to appreciate what that message is. That's stage one. Then, stage two, which is to recognize that if the prophecy is recorded in the Holy Bible for all generations, for posterity, it's because there is still, on an ongoing basis, something for us to learn from the prophecy. But I stress that that's stage two, because we need first to understand what the prophet is saying before we can understand what the prophet is saying to us. And understanding what the prophet is saying necessarily entails considering what he's saying to his contemporaries. So with that introduction, let's embark upon considering what the prophet Isaiah is saying to his contemporaries here. Beginning with chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Yotam, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. Remember, Uzziah was in the time frame for the last chapter. That Rutsin, the king of Aram, and Pekach, the son of Amaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to war against it, could not prevail against it. Now, in considering what the setting here is, we'll note that Judah, Israel, of course referring to northern Israel, the ten tribes that separated themselves from Judah and its cohorts at the time of Rechavam, the son of King Solomon. They and third kingdom, Aram, were, as we see very clearly in the book of Kings, continuously involved in skirmishes, battles among themselves. Alliances shifted, and in this instance, we have an alliance of Aram and northern Israel against Judah. And in verse 2 we read, it was told the house of David, saying, Aram is confederate with Ephraim. Ephraim, of course, referring to northern Israel, the tribe that in some sense is the leader of the ten tribes. And his heart was moved, and the heart of his people, as the trees of the forest are moved because of the wind. Now, of course, in context here, it's not entirely clear whose heart, whose people. Are we talking about Aram, Ephraim, or the house of David? The preferred interpretation, given the syntax here, would seem to identify the house of David as the ones whose hearts were moved together with the hearts of the people. We'll consider what that means a little bit later. But for our purposes at present, obviously, this was a very frightening circumstance that confronts Ahaz and his cohorts in Judah, that the two other states nearby, Israel and Aram, are both going to battle against Judah. And Isaiah is sent with a message. Then said God 
to Isaiah. Go forth now to meet Achaz, you and Sha'ar Yashuv, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And say to him, keep calm and be quiet. Fear not, neither let your heart be faint because of these two tails of smoking firebrands. They're not heads, they're tails. For the fierce anger of Ritzin and Aram and of the son of Remalia. Because Aram has counseled evil against you, Ephraim also, and the son of Remalia, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein. Or, alternatively, let us annex it to us, and set up a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tav'al. This was the plan of Judah's enemies. And the message to Ahaz, king of Judah, thus said God the Lord, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, the head of Damascus is Ritzim, and within three score and five years, 65 years, Ephraim will be broken that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramalia's son, Pekach. If you will not have faith, surely you will not be established. Alternatively, because the expression here is once again somewhat ambiguous, if you do not believe, it is because you cannot be believe. When we consider to whom this transparent rebuke is addressed, there is, of course, one obvious answer. And that pertains to the personality of the king of Judah to whom Isaiah is directing himself, Ahaz. And before we continue, I think it's instructive for us to consider as we did once a number of months ago, who Ahaz was, what he was like, and what were the circumstances in the time in which he reigned that occasioned, on the one hand, these words of rebuke, and on the other hand, this prophecy of doom for Judah's enemies. So for that, we turn to both the second book of Kings, chapter 16, and the second book of Chronicles, chapter 28. Truth is, what they tell us is almost exactly the same thing. Reading from the book of Kings, the beginning of chapter 16, in the 17th year of Pekach, the son of Amaliah, Achaz, the son of Yotam, king of Judah, began to reign. And what's relevant for our purposes, we read in verse 2, he did not that which was upright in the eyes of God, like David his father had done. Rather, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel and made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom God cast out from before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and offered in the high places and on the hills and under every leafy tree. Achaz, by the standard of righteousness and faithfulness to God, was a failure. Again, we read almost exactly the same description in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 28, first four verses of that chapter as well. Now, when we consider the circumstances that underlay the battles that are taking place in the time of Ahaz, we can readily appreciate the circumstances, namely, divine punishment. Let's continue in the second book of Kings, 
again, chapter 16, now from verse 5, where we read almost the exact same description as we see in our chapter in Isaiah, but with some critically important elaboration. In Isaiah chapter 7, we only read there was an attempt at a battle against Judah that was abortive. It failed. In the book of Kings, we read, Then Ritzin, king of Aram, and Pekach, son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Achaz, but could not overcome it. But there was a siege. That is, it wasn't merely passing through. There was something that took a great toll from Judah. And indeed, while the battle against Jerusalem ended for them in failure, and Ahaz persevered, in verse 6 we read, at that time, Ritzin, king of Aram, recovered Eilat to Aram and drove the Jews from Eilat. And the Edomites came to Eilat and dwelt there until this day. So there were battles in which Judah manifestly lost. Not only that. In the book of Kings, we don't read a much more detailed description, but in the book of Chronicles, we do. In the second book of Chronicles, chapter 28, we pick up with verse 5, and here we read, after the description of Ahaz's sins, Wherefore God his Lord delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, and they smote him, and carried away of his a great multitude of captives, and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. And as for the elaboration on the slaughter and on the captives, in the following verse we read, Pekach, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day. All of them valiant men. Why? because they had forsaken God, the God of their fathers. And the casualties include some that were especially close to Achaz himself. As for captives, in verse 8 we read, and the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters and took also away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So clearly, Judah is in an extremely precarious position. When the prophet Isaiah tells it, King Ahaz, be calm and be quiet, there were a lot of reasons not to be either calm or quiet. This is a time of great upheavals in the world. But besides the skirmishes, and worse than skirmishes, taking place with the small nearby kingdoms of Aram and Israel, there's a much, much greater threat looming on the horizon. And undoubtedly, that also pertains to the prophetic assurance that Isaiah gives Ahaz that Judah's enemies are going to be destroyed. The threat is Assyria. And indeed, what Isaiah states to Ahaz prophetically comes to pass. Because we read of the extremely unpleasant fates of both Ritzin, the king of Aram, and Pekach, the king of Israel. In the second book of Kings, again in chapter 16, from verse 7, because of all the battles that he was facing, Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglat Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son, come up and save me, out of the hand of the king of Aram and out of the hand of the king of Israel, who rise up against me. And this wasn't merely a request for charitable support. 
Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of God and in the treasuries of the king's house and sent it for bribery to the king of Assyria. In this version of the narrative, we read, the king of Assyria hearkened unto him. And the king of Assyria went up against Damascus, that is Aram, and seized it and carried the people captive, exiled it to Kir and slew Nitzin. So Aram was destroyed. Nitzin was slain. Well, that's what happened with Aram. What about with northern Israel? For this, it is perhaps most germane for us to go backward to chapter 15 in the second book of Kings, where we read more generally of the reign of Pekach, the son of Remayal, from verse 27 through 30. In verse 28, we read that Ahaz, king of Judah, was by no means the only sinful king of Israel at this time. Regarding Pekach, we read, and he did that which was evil in the sight of God. He departed not from the sins of Yerabam, the son of Nevat, wherewith he made Israel to sin, and he got his just deserts. In the days of Pekach, king of Israel, came Tiglat, Pil Eser, king of Assyria, and took all the cities. We read about Ion, Avel Beit Macha, Yanoach, Kedesh, Chatzor, the Gilad, the Galila, the entire land of Naphtali, that is, all of this generally situated in the northeastern part of the kingdom of Israel. Obviously, it's from that direction that Assyria is coming into the land of Israel. So all of them are exiled to Assyria. That's the beginning of the end of the kingdom of northern Israel. As for the end of Pekach, it came much more suddenly and precipitously. As you can imagine, the debacles taking place on the battlefield did not serve to make Pekach into a particularly popular king. And we read in verse 30, Hoshea, son of Elah, made a conspiracy against Pekach, the son of Rebeliah, and smote him and slew him and reigned in his stead. So, as for the enemies of Judah, both from Aram and from Israel, both Ritzin and Pekach, they got their just deserts. Just as the prophet Isaiah had foretold, they and their countries were destined for violent ruin in just a few more years. And simultaneously, there's an additional dimension that we should be stressing. When we consider what's taking place here, the battles of Ritzin and Pekach against Judah. You know, while on the one hand, we certainly appreciate their violence, their treachery, and their punishment, Consider what we read a little bit further down in the second book of Kings in chapter 15. Now, admittedly, this isn't speaking of the reign of Ahaz. This is speaking actually of the reign of Ahaz's father, Yotam, who, despite generally doing what was upright in the eyes of God, wasn't perfect. That is, as we noted in the past, the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and offered in the high places. The nation still had culpability. And we read in chapter 15, verse 37, in those days God began to send against Judah, Ritzim the king of Aram, and Pekach the son of Remalia. No. On the one hand, we saw that 
both Ritzin and Pekach are getting punished. But that doesn't contradict. They're also being divine instruments of punishment against Judah. Well, you might recall, we actually saw that already. That is, in Chronicles 2, chapter 28, verse 5, in the immediate aftermath of reading of the evil of Achaz, in verse 5, wherefore God, his Lord, delivered him, Achaz, into the hand of the king of Aram. And they smote him and carried away of his a great multitude of captives and so on. So Ritzin and Pekach are themselves culpable, but they are also instruments of divine punishment against the culpable, liable Achaz. This isn't a contradiction. Indeed, as we've noted in other contexts, much the same idea emerges from other passages in the Bible. And I think it's instructive for us, at least briefly, to consider them and understanding how, on a deeper level, we understand the geopolitical situation here. First, Deuteronomy chapter 22, in verse 8, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet, a railing, for your roof. Why? The text literally reads, although translations generally depart from this literal rendition because it seems so unbalanced. The reason you are to make a railing, a parapet, for your roof is that you not bring a liability of blood upon your house if the fuller falls from the house. That's what the text says. Most translations will state, if any man falls from the house. But in the Hebrew, it is hanofel, if the fuller from, calls, falls from the house. Which, of course, inevitably raises the question, he didn't fall. How can you call him a fuller already? Wait until he falls, then call him a fuller. And intimates a profound message about the world altogether. The world does not proceed haphazardly. The world, if you will, is living out a vast, dramatic script whose author is God. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, we read about God, that he is the one who called the generations from the beginning. I, God, who am the first, and with the last, am the same. God writes the script for all of world history. And in that vein, then, it certainly shouldn't be hard for us to understand that if someone is going to be falling off that roof, God already designated him to be a fallen. For whatever circumstance, punishment, whatever, he has been designated a fallen. So the text doesn't merely read, if any man falls from the roof, if the fuller falls. But wait a second. That obviously raises a second question. If he's a fuller, because God designated that he is to fall, why should you make a railing? It's God's decision that he should fall. Why the summons to make a railing, to make a parapet for the roof? Of course, the answer is, it's God's decision for him to fall. If you don't make the parapet, the railing for your roof, it's your decision to put blood in your house. It's your decision to be the agency of that fuller's death. You, on the other hand, have a responsibility. A responsibility to life. A responsibility to make 
the railing. If you shirk that, that responsibility, you have no one to blame but yourself. We've noted that there is a cryptic verse in Proverbs. I'll admit that this verse is subject to many different alternative translations, but we'll use the translation that I have on the sheets in front of us. Great is he who performs all, and he hires, hires the fool, and he hires transgressors. To understand what that means? Well, obviously. Great is he who performs all refers to God. Again, the one who writes the script. The script that includes within it everyone and everything. And God doesn't just write the script. He also hires the cast. Everyone, every human being is going to have a role to play in this drama. Because after all, each one of us was placed in this world as a deliberate act of creation by God. We can choose to do what God deems to be the good or the opposite can't choose to make ourselves irrelevant because we were put here for a reason. So a person can choose to ally himself with God's plan and do what is upright in God's eyes and thus be an agency in the actualization of God's plan. And a person can also choose to oppose God's plan, to do his utmost to commit the crimes that God has labeled as evil. And you know, by doing so, he'll also be cast in that drama that God writes. Because God doesn't just hire the wise and the righteous. He hires the fool. He hires transgressors. He hires everyone. Getting back to the narrative Ritzin and Pekach, on the one hand, again, as we saw, the instruments of God. In those days, God began to send against Judah, Ritzin, king of Aram, and Pekach, the son of Ramalia. But on the other hand, they're the ones who chose the course of culpability. They will pay the price and suffer the consequences. So it's, of course, important for us to bear that in mind in understanding the geopolitical events here. God is writing the script, but it's also a reflection of what's taking place in the minds and hearts, the decisions that are being made in these various capital cities. Again, the narrative of Ritzin and Aram, the narrative of Pekach and Israel, and what is, of course, most relevant for our purposes is the narrative of Ahaz, king of Judah. And in the prophet telling Ahaz, be calm and be quiet, perhaps we can discern not only words of reassurance, but also words of rebuke. Because Ahaz wasn't calm and he wasn't quiet. And this inevitably pertains not only to what's taking place in our chapter, but what's taking place altogether in Judah in this time. After we read again in the second book of Kings, chapter 16, about Ahaz soliciting the assistance of Tiglat Pileser the king of Assyria, in thwarting the plans of Aram and Israel against him, we read something more, something terrifying. In verse 10, 
King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pileser of Assyria. That is, presumably this is after Tiglath Pileser has conquered Aram and Damascus and slain Ritzin. So Ahaz goes to Damascus to see him, to meet him. And he saw the altar that was at Damascus and King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest the likeness of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the worksmanship thereof, he tells him to build a replica of this pagan, idolatrous altar. And he does so while Ahaz is still in Damascus, and when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king drew near unto the altar and offered thereon. He offered his burnt offering, his meal offering, his drink offering, dashed the blood of his peace offerings against the altar. And he makes this into an ideology. King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar, offer the morning burnt offering, the evening meal offering, and the king's burnt offering, and his meal offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, and their meal offerings, and their drink offerings, and dash against it all the blood of the burnt offerings, and all the blood of the sacrifices. But this is an idolatrous altar. It's not the altar that was in the Holy Temple, the brazen altar, the original altar that was in the Holy Temple, shall be for me to visit, or to look to, but not to use. We read additional elaboration, indeed terrifying elaboration, regarding Ahaz's plummet spiritually in the second book of Chronicles, in chapter 28. Here, on the other hand, we read, admittedly in contrast with the book of Kings, that Ahaz didn't get what he wanted from the emperor of Assyria. Could be that at times he did, and at times he did not. But here, in the second book of Chronicles, we read, at that time, King Ahaz sent unto the kings of Assyria to help him, for again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines had also invaded. They conquered various towns and cities, and they dwelt there. Why? There's a spiritual message. This isn't mere history, after all. In verse 19, For God brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had cast away restraint in Judah and acted treacherously against God. And then what happens? Then what happens as we read in the book of Chronicles is something that is arguably far more awesome and terrifying than anything that had been taking place in the Tiglath Pilneser, king of Assyria, came unto him, unto Judah, unto Ahaz, and distressed him, but strengthened him not. That is, he did, on the one hand, destroy Judah's enemies, but evidently it was exclusively because he already had an agenda to do so. For Ahaz stripped the house of God and the house of the king and the princes and gave thereof unto the king of Assyria, but it helped him not. Because the king of Assyria had his own agenda. And his own agenda included Judah also. So how does Ahaz react to this devastation? That things are spinning out of control. He spins out of control. In verse 22, and in the time of his distress... He acted even more treacherously against God, this same King Ahaz, for he sacrificed unto the gods of Damascus, which smote him. And he said, because the gods of the king of Aram helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me. Can't even help the kings of Aram. They were defeated. They were for him a cause of stumbling, for him and for all Israel. And then finally, the way of summation, in every city of Judah he made high places to offer unto other gods and provoked 
God, the God of his fathers. This is what's happening to Achaz. The whole area is engulfed in fire. Aram, Israel, Judah, at war with one another. Assyria marching in from the northeast, devastating everything. And Ahaz himself is spinning out of control, is in a very real sense just losing it. So this is all the historical background that we need to bear in mind before inevitably considering how this speaks to us. Now, let's return to the narrative as we encounter it in Isaiah chapter 7. Remember in particular in verse 3 that the message of become and be quiet was one that the prophet was not to deliver alone. In verse 3 we read, Then said God to Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, you and Sha'ar Yashuv, your son. We don't know anything else about Sha'ar Yashuv, son of Isaiah. The truth is, this is the only place in the Bible where we read about him. However, tantalizingly, we have another passage in Isaiah that speaks about Sha'ar Yashuv, not as a name, as a phrase. The words Sha'ar Yashuv as we noted here in brackets, means a remnant shall return. And Isaiah uses that self-same phrase twice, back to back, in Isaiah chapter 10. Beginning in verse 20, we read, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and they that are escaped of the house of Jacob, shall no more lean upon him that smote them, but shall lean upon God, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. What does that sentence mean? Leaning upon him that smote them. Of course, there's a very obvious meaning that couldn't be more relevant when God sends Isaiah to Ahaz to tell him, be calm and be quiet. Be calm and be quiet can mean many things, but perhaps most directly relevant is, you sit still and don't go off to Assyria to try to make an alliance with Assyria against Aram and against Israel. It would be kind of like if you have an insect problem dropping a bomb on your house. Assyria is aimed towards the destruction of everything. If you have a problem with Aram and with Israel, don't lean on Assyria. The only one upon whom you should be leaning is God. And it is in this vein that the prophecy in chapter 10 continues, verse 21, a remnant shall return. Sha'al Yashu. Even the remnant of Jacob unto God the mighty. Note, we're not speaking of returning geographically from exile. We're referring to returning to God. A remnant shall return. Verse 22. For though if your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them shall return. Again, Sha'ar Yashuv. An extermination is determined, overflowing with righteousness. To whom is that addressed? What does the phrase mean? Another way of translating that phrase is, 
the remnant of them that shall return shall wash away with righteousness the decreed destruction. Now, it isn't clear in this verse whether we're describing a decreed destruction against Judah that is being thwarted or an actual decree of destruction, of extermination, that is to be actualized, actualized against Assyria. In the next verse, we read, an extermination wholly determined shall God, the God of hosts, make in the midst of all the earth. Therefore, thus says God, the God of hosts, O oh, my people that dwells in Zion, be not afraid of Assyria. So he smite you with the rod and lift up his staff against you after the manner in the way of Egypt for yet a very little while and the indignation shall be over and my anger which is because of Assyria's blasphemy will climax and be fulfilled. And the God of hosts will stir up against him a scourge, as in the smiting of Midian at the rock of Oreb, and as his rod was over the sea, so shall he lift it up, or so shall Assyria be carried off in the manner, in the way of Egypt. Like Egypt is exiled, so is Assyria. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will depart from off your shoulder and his yoke from off your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed by reason of fatness. Assyria, fattening itself, is doomed to destruction. That's the message of Shari Yashuv. And that, of course, inevitably is the message of be calm and be quiet. So when we consider just what is to be gleaned from Sha'ar Yashuv, and admittedly, the other children of whom we read in the verses that follow, because there are another two children to whom the prophet introduces us in the subsequent verses, we can well appreciate a message that emerges in chapter 8. In verse 18, I'm going to begin with verse 17 here. Says the prophet, I will wait for God, who hides his face from the house of Jacob. I will hope for him. Verse 18, Behold, I and the children whom God has given me will be for signs and wonders, portents, tokens, in Israel from the God of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. In short, says Isaiah, what you see right now the skirmishes with Aram and Israel, the battles that they are fighting against you, you're just seeing one very narrow sliver of an enormous picture. And Shar Yashuv is here to remind you, a remnant will return. When? When will it happen? I will wait for God who hides his face from the house of Jacob. I will hope for him. Beyond that, we see a present, a storm, a tempest. And we don't see that broader picture that yet lies ahead. Now let's consider that. Again, returning to the words of our chapter. We noted 
that with respect to the designs of Aram and Israel, God says it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. That is, they have their plans, God has his. God is the one who writes the drama. God wrote the script. The plans of Aram, the plans of Israel, are doomed to destruction. For the head of Aram is Damascus, the head of Damascus is Rutsin. Within 65 years, the shrine will be broken. Not to be a people. And again, those words of rebuke, if you do not believe it, because you cannot be believed. And this becomes dramatically expressed in the continuation of the passage, that God spoke again to Ahaz, saying, in verse 11, Ask a sign of God your Lord, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. And Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I test God. Now, we should appreciate what's taking place here. The prophet delivered tidings of salvation for Judah and of destruction for Aram and Israel. But Ahaz isn't exactly a faithful believer. He's not interested in a connection with God. In a way, he's not even interested in being saved by God. I'm not asking for a sign. I'm not going to test God as if because of his great piety, but he wasn't pious. He basically is saying, I'm not interested in a connection at all. And the divine response, obviously, through Isaiah is, hear you now, O house of David. Is it a small thing for you to weary men that you will weary my God also? Therefore, God of his own will give you a sign. Behold, the young woman will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Hebrew 4, God is with us. Curd and honey shall he eat when he knows to refuse the evil and choose the good. Before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you have a horror of shall be forsaken. God will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Now, on the one hand, there's something positive here. No longer will Israel be split into two houses. Yeah, but no longer because one of those houses will be utterly destroyed. The king of Assyria is coming. This is a period of upheaval, of transformation in the world scene. Everything that was expected until now, everything to which you and all of your contemporaries were accustomed is gone. For the first time, a world empire is invading the land. Assyria is on the march. Israel and Aram are both to be laid low. Judah threatened as well. A massive transformation an upheaval, everything to which everyone had grown accustomed is going to be swept away. And indeed, we read in verse 18 and on a description of this dramatic transformation. We don't have time to read the verses inside. They certainly are dramatic in their description of what's taking place. And simultaneously, what's happening with Ahaz? Ahaz says, oh, I'm not going to ask. I'm not going to test God. Now, of course, on the one hand, in his saying that, he intimates the words of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. You shall not test God your Lord as you tested him in Massah, provoking God because of unfaithfulness. What you should do is diligently keep the commandments of God, his testimonies, his statutes, which he has commanded you, and do 
what is upright and good in the sight, in the, in the sight of God, that it may be well with you, and you may come in and possess the good land that God swore to your fathers to thrust out all your enemies from before you as God has spoken. But of course, in context, it is nothing short of profoundly ironic that Achaz should invoke these words about not testing God when he is completely divorced from keeping the commandments of God, from doing what is upright and good in the sight of God. And again, what's taking place? You're in a ship in the middle of a tempest in the sea, and it looks like the ship is sinking. And Achaz, as the captain of his ship, acts in desperation. Bring in the gods. Maybe this god will work. Maybe that god will work. And Judah is foundering in the tempest. And there's one additional dimension that we should stress that is in the process that is being outlined here. After Isaiah describes the conflagration, the destruction, he also describes salvation in verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall rear a young cow and two sheep, and it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, and he shall eat curd. For curd and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the midst of the land. Curd and honey, just like, remember, what Emmanuel eats as a sign to Achaz of Achaz's imminent salvation from Aram and Israel. Because indeed, Aram and Israel are being swept away. And simultaneously, when you consider the subsequent verses, exactly how to understand the message of these verses, I have to admit it isn't clear. But it certainly doesn't sound like living in paradise. It shall come to pass in that day that every place where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silver limbs shall even be for briars and thorns. With arrows and with bow shall one come to them there, because all the land will become briars and thorns, full of wild animals. And all the hills that were hoed with the hoe, you shall not come there for fear of briars and thorns. It shall be for sending forth of oxen, for the treading of sheep, a land that is spared, but desolate. The old world order is gone. A new order is dawning. And it is in that vein that we consider the first four verses of chapter 8 as appended to this description. Because on the one hand, it's simply a continuation of the prophecy of destruction regarding Aram and Israel. God said to me, take a great tablet or scroll and write upon it in common script so everyone can read it. The spoil speeds, the prey hastens. And I will take unto me faithful witnesses to record Uriah the priest, Zechariah the son of Yerachiah. And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Third child in this prophetic series. We encountered She'ar Yashuv. We encountered Immanuel. We will return to Immanuel in the continuation of chapter 8. And this son. God said to me, call his name Maher Shalal Chashbaz. That is, indeed, the Hebrew that was supposed to be written upon the scroll. Same meaning. The spoil speeds, 
the prey hastens. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be carried away before the king of Assyria. So again, we're at the stage of Assyria is sweeping through here, completely transforming the landscape. Damascus and Samaria, gone. Complete desolation. Judah, devastated as well. Full of thorns and briars. Prosperity. The prosperity in a ruined land. And developments are taking place, again, as the prophet so aptly described it, God will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Something entirely unanticipated. Something fundamentally new. You won't even know how to navigate. You won't even understand what's happening. And you know, inevitably, when we consider the theme in the opening verse of chapter 8, take a great tablet or scroll and write upon it in common script, the spoil speeds the prehastens. One can't help but consider the similar description that we read in the second chapter of Habakkuk where we read likewise. The prophet says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will look out to see what he will speak by me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And God answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that a man may read it swiftly. For the vision is, and here's where we get to the vision. Admittedly, this is the vision of Habakkuk. I think it's critically important for us to bear in mind here as well. And with this, inevitably, we're going to conclude. The vision is yet for the appointed time, and it declares of the end and does not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not delay. It's not coming soon. And you know, when we consider what's taking place in chapter 7 and chapter 8 in Isaiah, these dramatic global upheavals, geopolitical chaos, and the prophet gives us a glimpse of where matters are heading. And besides that glimpse, Truth is, we really don't understand. We don't know. God hasn't told us. But God commands the prophet. In the case of Isaiah, it is the tablet upon which he is to write the message of destruction and doom to Aram and Israel, in the case of Habakkuk, it is the message of an appointed time, final conclusion, but that tarries. It will surely come. It will not delay once the time is right. But we don't know when that is. And the final verse in this passage in Chalakuch, I think, is one that may well provide us with a valuable summary of what we see in Isaiah as well. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright in him. Obviously, that's talking about the wicked. The soul is puffed up. The arrogance, the brazenness. Like Achaz saying... I'm not going to ask for any signs. I'm in business for myself. I don't need God. And this as opposed to. 
but the righteous shall live in his faith. It's a literal translation. Often we find the phrase the tzaddik be'emunaton yichyeh rendered as the righteous shall live by his faith. But I think translating it as in his faith is instructive. For the righteous, faith is not the conclusion. It's not even the starting point. It's the framework. All of life, the righteous lives in his faith. We stand gazing out upon a world in turmoil. I think that's something that we can very, very keenly appreciate right now. Granted, Isaiah was talking about a different set of turmoils. Ironically, it was a set of turmoils that came from the direction of Syria and Iraq. Not terribly different from the situation right now. Except that, of course, at least then they had Isaiah. We don't have any prophets. Not right now. What we have are the prophets of old. The words of Isaiah guiding his contemporaries and guiding us as well. We know that there is a great scriptwriter, the one who calls all the generations from the start. God, who is orchestrating everything that's taking place. It's not haphazard. There's a system. There's a system, and that system, of course, we don't know. We don't understand. But we know, this we know, that when we live by our faith, when we live in that world of faith, that provides the framework of everything that we see and everything that we derive from the world in which we're living, we know we're living with God. That, ultimately, is the most precious equipment we can summon in a world of upheaval. That, more than anything else, enables us sense and to receive God's blessings. God bless you.